further ado, Tristan Walker. Come on. Yep. All right. <laughs> you, you know, I'm famously disliking of hugs. Ah, uh, well. Except with my we'll children. Have to that. <laughs> um, except with my children, which I, who I do hug, because um, it's it's supposed to be good for them. Um, so. <laughs> Actually, I was talking to my son just, we've talked a lot about this, and I was trying to explain to him, he's 11, what I was doing. And, um, and so uh, I, said, I said, this is what it is, this is what they do. Um, and, and he goes, gosh, that serves a real need. Like my son who's so. 11, who's kind of a nerdy. <laughs> um, but why don't you explain what you do for people who don't know what you do? Let's not assume everybody does. Of course. So, um, so about three years ago, uh, I founded a company, Walker & Company, uh, with the goal to make health and beauty simple uh, for people of color. Uh, so Walker Company is going to build a family of brands specifically tasked with the goal of solving problems uh, that folks of color have in health and beauty. Uh, we started with a brand called Bevel. Uh, Bevel is the first and only end-to-end -end shaving system designed to help prevent uh, and reduce shaving irritation for men and women. It's kind of crazy having to say that, right? Mm -hmm. Like shaving's been around for hundreds of years and no one's solved this problem. Uh, we did it uh, with a clinically proven solution. Uh, so Bevel's our first brand. We're going to launch our second brand this year uh, in short order. Uh, we hope to launch, you know, uh, a brand every couple of years or so. Uh, and, you know, I'm very, very proud of that fact, and we're working on some important things. So let's talk about that idea of finding this niche. You, you worked at other places, nothing to do with this. You worked <laughs> Not at, at Foursquare <laughs> and yes. other places. What pre presented you to be reaching into a commerce area, mm -hmm. first of all, and, and, and in, in this niche area? So, and is it niche? Yes, yeah, so I'll start backwards. So it's yeah. not niche at all. Right. You know, I get this all the time. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of investors and other folks saying, oh, why are you tackling such a small niche opportunity? Well, I ask, well, folks of color, the majority of the world, how do you assume that that's niche, right? Uh, and what's well, funny is a lot of folks will say, well, they're trying to build the Procter & Gamble for people of color. Two things interesting about that. Number one, I've never said it. Number two, you know, if we're building the Procter yeah. & Gamble for people of color, what is Procter & Gamble building, yeah. right? Like, we have a larger <laughs> opportunity than they. Um, so, you know, to the former, I had no idea I was going to be in commerce. Right. At all. Okay. Um, so after Foursquare, I joined Idris and Horowitz, a venture capital firm. They gave me nine months to figure something out, what I wanted to build. Um, and, you know, the story goes, I would just chase ambition. Mm -hmm. Right? You want to build a bank. You want to fix trucking. Uh, and then you realize, what do I know about trucking? Right? <laughs> right? Like, if I'm going to dedicate the next 20, 30 years in life to anything, I wanted to fundamentally feel, uh, matter of factly, with no ego, that I was going to be the best person in the world to solve that problem, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I reflected back uh, on, you know, just my life, uh, and I couldn't shave, right? None of the tools that I could use worked for me. Uh, and there are a lot of folks like me, uh, you know, 80% of black men and women, 30, 40% of, uh, you know, white men and women, uh, and other races as well. And I felt there's a seismic opportunity to do something pretty special here combined with the fact that you know, we're just not treated well at retail. Right. Uh, I felt there was an opportunity to build an elevated brand with an amazing experience for folks with efficacious products that just worked, uh, and to do it in a way and leveraging everything that I've learned in Silicon Valley to build the next generation CPG company from the ground up. And finally, um, you know, Procter & Gamble is 175 years old. Mm -hmm. Johnson & Johnson is 125 years old. Unilever 60 plus. Who else is left? Right. So I felt there was a wide open opportunity to build something with that much legacy. Why is it, it is looked at though in the retail space as a niche area. That's right? their problem, That's not their mine. Problem. <laughs> but why is that, what, what, because e-commerce has a bigger opportunity in that regard. Is it the difficulty of getting into stores or getting people to go, what, is, what has been the problem? No, I think there's been products, like there's been products aimed at African Americans and all kinds kind yeah, of Yeah, I mean, there, there have been products aimed at uh, kind of folks of color, but it right. just happens to be a retrofitted product, and, right, and exactly. then you put like a black Latina uh, kind of actress on your commercials and hope that it sells. It just doesn't right. work that way, right? right? right. Um, so, look. L'Oreal. Yeah, I mean, right. uh, just all the brands, right? I mean, there's, there's no one that's kind of uh, specific. They're all kind of subject to this issue. Uh, and the one thing that I found was, look, all you need is something, someone authentic, right, willing to tell a message uh, that is authentic with products that actually work. The formula doesn't require anything more than that, right? Mm -hmm. And if we're speaking to people in a way that's relevant, authentic, uh, in, in ways that they can actually resonate with, mm -hmm. you don't have to do anything. And, you know, folks can very easily look at any of our other competitors who happen to peddle things like multi-blade razors, mm -hmm. uh, and then they put this, like, black celebrity in the commercial, and just looking at it, it's like, that's a lie, right? Because I know it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And 80% of us know it doesn't work, but you continue to pay these folks millions of dollars to kind of promulgate this message 
of ridiculousness, <laughs> right? So I felt there was an opportunity to actually do it the right way. So what's different about the products? Explain those. Absolutely. Um, so Bevel, um, you know, the reason why we say it's the first and only kind of end-to-end system. Now you did have a celebrity system. smokes model. We do. Yeah. Um, but the funny thing is, so, so Bevel, we have seven products. The first six of them are a shaving system, which kind of we're probably most well known for. Right. At least until last year when we launched our electric trimmer product. Uh, it's a trimmer product that we believe is the most advanced trimmer product on the planet. Nas, the hip-hop artist, is uh, not only an investor of ours, but also a brand ambassador for it. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason uh, that has worked for us, and Nas has put us in songs and all this stuff without any payment from us or anything in the store, truly authentic. Right. Um, you know, I got a text from Nas. Uh, well, it's crazy to even say that. Um, <laughs> so we were texting, and the one thing that really sticks out in my mind, he said, Tristan, for my entire life, I've wanted to see my face on trimmer packaging. Right? Now the reason that's wow, so that's important. That's a big goal. No, but no, but it's 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 it, it's significant. I mean we laugh at it, but it's a very big deal. Nas is kind of very well known for his grooming, right? He's very <laughs> sharp. He had I he has this famous kind of half moon part in his hair. It's something that I had when I was 14 years old until I was 19. So it's crazy mm -hmm. to experience like his actually leveraging our products to actually kind of um, kind of cut his hair. Yeah. And he had this kind of famous quote in um, the song that he came out with last summer. He said, My signature fade with the bevel blade, uh, that's a major key. It's crazy to just think about. I'm a kid from Queens, New York. Nas is from Queens, New York. He's a guy I looked up to. I would go to the barbershop every Saturday to ask for this iconic haircut. And now the only kind of tool that he relies on for that iconic look is the bevel trim. So that is authenticity to like the fullest. Right? <laughs> so you, um, do you think of yourself as an e-commerce play or because that's, or a CPG? Cause it, or yeah. do you have to even, because there's been some trouble with a lot of There's, there's been a morph in this. Um, yeah. So when I started, you know, I said, you know, we're a tech company, right? That's bullshit. Like we are a CPG company that leverages technology in innovative ways to build this thing from the ground up. And okay. we've had to learn that over the years, right? Did you um, think of yourself as a technology company? We thought of ourselves as a technology company you were like so we could raise the money. VCs and yeah, I mean, look, I mean, you go to any kind of venture capital firm on Sand Hill Road, you say you want to build a retail business, you're not going to raise any money, right? right. Um, so to say that you're a direct to consumer e commerce business focused on subscription, which we were, and that was our sole focus, it allows us to really talk about how we kind of focused on tech. Mm -hmm. Not only that, most of our customers are shaving for either the first time ever uh, or the second time ever because they've used multi-blade razors in the past, they've been dealt this false bill of goods, et cetera, mm -hmm. so they've written off razors completely. Um, so it requires our supplying them with education, one-on-one uh, right. -on -one video chats with them where necessary and doing things with technology to actually enhance the experience. Uh, but we've learned over time um, Retail has started to take over in a significant right. way for so us. So it's crossing the line. I want to well. talk about in, the minute, but let's way. talk about raising the money. When you went yeah. in as an e com we mm -hmm. had talked about this on the podcast, yeah. uh, all kinds of different things yeah. that you experienced. Can <laughs> totally. you talk about a few of them? Like, first of all, going in as an e commerce company. Of course, of course. Um, so I think I have some investors here who I'm truly thankful for. So we've raised a series C, A, and a B. How much total? Um, so we've raised $33 million to right. date, and we've had the same investors every single round. And it's, it's an important thing to really keep in mind for two reasons. And one, we like to keep it in the family. Uh, but two, there are a lot of folks that just still don't get what we do. Right. right? Um, and the thing that I like to say is there are a lot of folks that let their lack of context cloud their judgment. And okay. you know, I illuminate that with really a single story. It's my very first pitch I've ever done, mm -hmm. right? I'm a nervous wreck. Um, I go in, um, a woman of color actually, um, mm -hmm. who I really respected. Uh, when I was at Force Grad, a lot of VCs said, you know, whatever you do, I'll fund it. And it's funny when you go to them and ask them for the money. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I'll never forget this moment. We had a except pitch that. deck. I'll do that, except that. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, so slide 14, and I remember this very vividly. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a, an image of Proactive. Now, that's a company I really respected. And I tried to explain our bevel business similar to kind of Guthy Ranker's Proactive. Where you have Proactive, and then you have like Neutrogena. Mm -hmm. If you have an acne issue, you can go to CVS and get Neutrogena for six ninety five, mm -hmm. or you can pay twenty nine ninety five a month for the system for Proactive right. that's clinically proven to work, et cetera. I thought about Bevel in the same way. We're just a skincare solution that uses shaving products to fix sure. this very important skincare issue. So what she said to me was one of the most profound things I had ever heard, which kind of um, foreshadowed how difficult it would be to raise money. And she said, Tristan, I'm not sure issues related to um, razor bumps and irritation uh, are as big a societal issue as issues related to shaving irritation or as, as acne, right? Mm -hmm. At which point I thought, well, I kind of understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But before you said it, all you had to do was get on the phone with 10 black men, nine of them would have said this is the worst thing ever. Mm -hmm. You get on the phone with 10 white men or 10 white women, 
and four of them would have said, this is the worst thing ever. So that's a classic example of her letting her own context cloud her judgment, or lack of context. And if this is a woman of color telling this to me, you know, 99% of folks on the other side of the table, white men, they sure as hell weren't gonna get it. Right. So I'm truly thankful uh, to the investors that we've had, because they've got it every single time. And the thing I tell a lot of um, the investors is, I get it, I understand it, uh, we'll come back to you, it just might be a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And did you, <laughs> was there, did you find it difficult to raise money given? It's it, difficult, it still is difficult. Um, because of what? Because of the, that it's an e-commerce play or because? No. Well, it's a couple things. Number one, no one wants to fund e-commerce companies anymore. Right. right. There's been no shortage of e-commerce companies that have just failed, certainly recently. Yeah. Right? Um, no one wants to fund a retail business. Or they, they get overvalued right? and can't sell. Exactly, exactly. Right. Um, you know, folks really tend to want the high-flying growth companies. Mm -hmm. We take a bit of an opposite approach. Like, I care about profitability and free cash flow. Mm -hmm. uh, even for our current investors, you know, I love them to death, uh, but we always have this pull and tug, like growth, profitability, growth, profitability, growth, profitability. Mm -hmm. um, and I care about doing the one thing that a lot of e-commerce companies haven't done. Like, can we actually build an e-commerce company that's generating significant free cash flow, building a suite of brands that people can love and admire? Um, so it's, it's really hard, particularly in the Silicon Valley context, because they haven't seen a company like ours. Mm -hmm. Not only from the e-commerce or kind of retail omni-channel approach, but focus on people of color. That's something that a lot of folks in Silicon Valley don't focus on. Yeah, they don't do that. They don't I've at noticed all, that. Right? Yeah. So we're always swimming upstream. Right. And I'm very thankful and fortunate to have a team of folks um, that recognize that. Mm -hmm. They know that we have to be disciplined in our approach to actually running a business and not rely on fundraising, and that's what we're doing. Why is that in Silicon Valley? Why do they do that? Because it's obviously a big market. If I had the answer to that, I'd probably raise a lot more money than I have. I, I, <laughs> right? I bet you have a thought about that, though. I mean, look, uh, there's a couple things about us. Number one, just look at the makeup of our company, mm -hmm. right? We're an incredibly diverse company, majority minority, majority woman. Most of my senior leaders are women of color, right? Our diversity reflects the diversity of our consumer base. This is a strategic advantage, right? Mm. Uh, any pitch that I go to, you look on the other side of the table, they don't reflect the diversity of our consumer base. Right. They don't reflect the diversity of our employee base, mm -hmm. right? Like, this is a problem. Uh, and I'm optimistic, uh, hopefully, that that'll change. Um, but what that requires for us, maybe we shouldn't raise VC money, right? Like, right. there's all types of kind of considerations in that regard, so but we're fine. Why, why is there that lack of diversity, do you think? given it works for your company, and so many studies show that, mm -hmm. it still remains an enormous, you know, I joke about Uber, but for fuck's sake, you know, I'm sorry, but you know. Yeah, I mean, look, it doesn't have to happening. be that way. It's very simple. Like, it, I mean, there's nothing, we did it, we did it, right? right? And it's not only that, like, we're majority minority, majority woman, and all that stuff. Most of the folks come from the East Coast, they fly and live in Palo Alto from, like, New York City, like, that's <laughs> not, they self-select into this. Right. Uh, and I haven't even had to try. And the thing that, you know, we talked about this a little bit on the mm -hmm. podcast, and I like to kind of promulgate more broadly, the way that we figured out is not um, necessarily being deliberate, like, hey, I need this number of Latinos, <laughs> like this number of black folks. Right. Yeah. You know, we recruit through our own values, mm -hmm. period, right? We have six, like courage, inspiration, respect, judgment, wellness, and loyalty. That doesn't speak to gender, mm -hmm. it doesn't speak to race. Those are values that everybody can really get behind, and I think it's caused a lot of the diversity. So how do people do it? Take an audit of your values, right? right. And you'll realize a lot. A lot of companies do have those values written at least into their mission statement. A lot of companies do not have values written in their well, mission statement, the, and in, even the ones that do have it, they, don't they do actually it. don't act on it, right? right? So I wrote them down, and I made sure, even more importantly, it was kind of, um, infiltrate in every single thing that we do. So when we ask uh, interview questions, we'll ask leading questions to get at your loyalty and your courage, mm -hmm. right? When we do semi-annual annual reviews, you're rated against your goal attainment, but also your adherence to the values. I wanna build a company that's around 200 years from now, and the only way to do it is to know who you are. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be around 200 years from now, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Maybe. So that legacy needs to carry on, and that's very important to me. Right. Right. Do you, um, let's get back to the business of what, what you're doing. You have, you put out the bevel products yeah. and the shaving products. That's right. You were going to introduce a line for women. That's right. A little late. In a few months. A few, okay. It's not late. It's not it's late? right on time. All right, okay. <laughs> it's right on time. <laughs> you're never late till you get there. Um, well, I mean, let's, let's think about this, though. We're but a team talk of, about those products. I want to... Of course. Um, so I can't announce exactly what we're doing, but I'll tell you kind of uh, where we're going. 
We have a team of 25 people. Uh, we've built. That's all you have? We only have 25 people. With raising that much money? Uh, well, it's not that much money. We have right. a physical goods product. By the end of you know the summer, we will have had 20 products: soft goods, hard goods, electric goods. Right. Uh, 20, so I it's think a very that's incredibly lean team. For that. Relative to any competitor in our space who yeah. raised orders of magnitude greater than we, I am incredibly excited and proud of what we've been Why able to so build. Why so small? Why so small? Mm -hmm. We don't have to. <laughs> right? right. I mean, it's that's like I want to build a business. Um, mm -hmm. Look, at the end of the day, at some point, we might have to raise money, but I can focus on actually kind of building a business that I matters. See. Okay, so the women's product. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, you know, here's something that I care very deeply about. Um, and kind of this will kind of spill not only into what we're going to launch with, but what kind of future verticals we can tap into are. Um, so I have this vision, at least in all of health and beauty, mm -hmm. if you look at kind of the back of the bottle or the box that you have, it has this ingredients list, mm -hmm. right? The inky list. It's 50 different things. Theoretically, that shouldn't exist, mm -hmm. right? Like I should give you a bottle and you know that like there's a trust that not only are those products kind of natural, but the contents of them are uniquely tailored to your use case mm -hmm. and your lifestyle the humidity in a zip code where you live, right? Like the pH levels of your water, like all that stuff. Uh, and when we think about it, there's a lot of all these kind of new companies touting this whole idea of personalization. Right. In fact, you know, I read uh, about one company that claimed to have like trillions of kind of permutations of product that you can use. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we only have seven billion people on the planet. Like, why do we need trillions of right. like combinations? <laughs> and I think people really lose sight of like, you know, the personal part of personalization, mm -hmm. right? It's not about the, the color of the kind of oils and creams that you have or the smell. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta keep in mind, like, what's the zip code this person lives in? Mm -hmm. How does the environment interact with this person's use of the bottle? If this person travels from this zip code to another with different humidities and pH, et cetera, you need to kind of offer this person something uniquely tailored to that person. Right. Not only that, look, health and beauty is a half a trillion dollar industry built completely on the shoulders of subjectivity. No one has any semblance of knowledge or understanding about whether or not these products are actually working quantifiably and objectively. We've done that, we will do that, that'll be our next brand and it'll come out in a couple months. And, and what products are you gonna make? Uh, I cannot speak to that. Can't speak. But, uh, look, I mean, we care to kind of make products in every single vertical, uh, solving kind of acute health and beauty problems that folks have. We started with the shaving irritation issue. You think about things like uh, hyperpigmentation, vitamin D deficiency, the prevalence of miscarriage in the community, mm -hmm. or early onset diabetes. These are all incredibly ambitious things mm -hmm. that we want to tackle. Uh, and if I just listed off all those things, you have a 100-year roadmap right there. So you, when you're thinking about go, where to go next, so yeah. women's is obviously enormous, yeah. enormous comparative. What about within, where else do you go? Because a lot of people, they do get too overwhelmed with too many products. Yeah. Um, so if we do it right, Bevel uh, and this new brand uh, could theoretically be the only two brands that we need because this next brand could appeal to multiple mm -hmm. verticals. Um, so the thing that we care about for growth, um, which I think is fun and unique now, we've mitigated a lot of the risk in the business with multiple brands, multiple products, distribution online and offline. One thing we haven't even talked about is international. Right. Opportunity is way bigger international than it is domestic, right? Mm -hmm. That's something that we want to uh, certainly in 2018, 2019 kind of focus on in a very, mm -hmm. very big way. Um, even within kind of the Bevel brand itself, Bevel is exclusively focused on solving the shaving irritation issue. But there are some kind of prep products that you can have to help solve this issue. You think about Bevel for Women, you know, we have some 5 to 10% of our customers are women currently. So we want to adapt the kind of form factor and use case to fix kind of that use case. Right. I mean, just on that alone, right. that's the next three to four years of so, <laughs> stuff that we can work on. So you've been having more and more of your products. You, you, you're looked as an online company, but that's right. and you start up a subscription. That's right. Now you sell individually. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then I'd love yep. to understand how much retail is half your business yeah, now, Yeah, right? it's, it's completely and different. And where? Target yeah, and now, Yeah, so we, we started distribution in uh, Target and Amazon last year for the Bevel brand. This new brand has a pretty major retailer that we're going to be working with on launch, which we're very excited about, completely separate from, from those two as well. Uh, we're still kind of speaking with um, kind of a few folks. It's nothing like super, super close, but we care about retail in a big way, specifically because last year uh, retail was 10% of our business. This year, it'll be 50% of our business. Um, subscription, um, well, a la carte has already taken significantly over its subscription. So the thing that's interesting that goes back to some of the kind of fundraising things, folks look at our business, immediately they go to the cohort tables. Mm -hmm. Like, what do your churn rates look like, mm -hmm. right? Like, what does the gross margin for this cohort look like? And it's like, that's not our business anymore. 
Right. And the thing that people really don't understand, retail is an incredibly profitable business. It's an incredibly predictable business. And the biggest mistake probably that I, I made as the CEO of this company is leading with subscription first. Um, because, look, you want to well, raise the safe. money. You want to raise the money. Well, it's safe because you want to raise the money as a tech company. Mm -hmm. You get punch drunk by like the kind of unit economics of subscription. It's an incredibly valuable business. Mm -hmm. um, but that comes with the sacrifice of the customer experience. And the minute we opened it up for a la carte, we realized we just got to be where our customers are. Most of our customers are shopping offline. They want a trial. So now we think, all right, well, we have this incredibly profitable offline model to drive trial, um, and our products are sold at premium prices in that offline channel. How do we activate that trial into more value-based subscription, which we're already starting to see? they use later once they start using Exactly. It. So we started subscription to a la carte when we probably should have done a la carte to subscription. But now that I learned that, that's exactly what we're going to do for our second brand. A la carte to subscription. That's right. To subscription. That's right. You know, talk about the retail experience, because one of the things was bad retail experiences. Bad retail experience for us? Yeah. It's, it hasn't been bad at all. No, I mean, no. What I mean is, is people going into the stores and, and, and finding them available, having people being able to sell them properly. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's one of the more annoying things. Fortunately, we have kind of great partners in, in Target to really help us with that. You know, the thing that I hate most, you know, you go to, you know, well, f f first of all, uh, the one thing I'm proud of is that kind of we got these shaving products um, that were traditionally in this like ethnic beauty aisle mm -hmm. uh, to kind of like a beautiful positioning within the main shave aisle, right? Uh, we've also shown... How difficult was that? Uh, it wasn't difficult at all, and here's why. Uh, the lead personal care buyer for all of Target and the lead of Shave were already subscribers of the Bevel Shave product before we got into Target. Right? So it was very simple yeah. and very easy. And yeah. thank you, Ray. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so you know, when, when folks go in that aisle, we want to make sure they have the most elevated experience. Right. right? Um, so when you see kind of products like either empty or off the shelf, like you get frustrated by it, but then it, it really begs the question, shit, people are buying this thing, <laughs> right? It's selling out. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. Um, but you just learn how to run retail, right? It's just a very, very different kind of business. And fortunately, we have partners with us that are patient enough to help us learn it. So do you call yourself an online e-commerce? No, we call ourselves, we are, we are a CPG company. That just happens to. I mean, we, look, I think a lot of people will see this thing, especially with the next brand, like the technology story will really start to make some sense mm -hmm. uh, in a very, very big way. Right. But look, I mean, for those customers, we do one-on-one -on -one video chats with them. Uh, you know, for folks that travel, you can't send your blades like through TSA, so we'll ship it to their destination free of charge, right? Our understanding around like who this customer is, uh, where he it's or she is, than just yeah, thing. how we communicate with them. So, what, like, what's it's the end game for you? And then I want to talk about the larger e-commerce. Sure. What you think of what's going on with Amazon and others? What yeah. is the end game? Do you want to sell your company? Do you imagine Unilever walking up and saying? So I, I tell uh, a couple of folks, I tell my employees this. I, I, I fundamentally, I'm not giving you the kind of an entrepreneur cliche. Well, you could like be. I, like, I, I want this company to be around 200 years from now. Like, my name's on the company. I, 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 <laughs> that is like my stake in the ground, and I care a great deal about that. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as we continue to have folks, at least at our company, that believe that that's possible, mm -hmm. you know, I think we'll be fine. So what, did, what is that game then? Is it go public, or what's Yeah, the... so you know, what I tell all of my employees is, look, um, you know, we got to make our investors and them liquid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for me to say that that's not a thing, that would be silly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so either you know, we can theoretically sell to a large incumbent or IPO. Mm -hmm. The thing that matters to me is that we have the autonomy to fulfill that vision to be around 200 years from now. Which, that's really important. What's the worry that you face every day when you're doing this? The because worry a, there's I face? a lot of e-commerce companies now. You see a lot of honest, yeah. all kinds of troubles all sure, over the place. Sure, sure. And a lot of hope in the beginning of it. Yeah. Um, so I say two things. I kind of learned this from like Ben Horowitz. He's like, you know, your job as CEO, you have two jobs. Number one, make sure people don't give up. Two, you make sure you don't run out of money, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's only two reasons any companies fail, if you really think about it, right? Um, so for me, I'm pretty sure that to the former, I can, you know, have a good job on. Like, we have folks that really love being at that company. To the latter, look, I can only control that in one of two ways, just building a business that matters, that's generating free cash flow or pitching investors. I can't guarantee that they're willing to invest in our company. Uh, at least the kind of the previous three times that we've tried, we've had the great investors give us what we've needed, uh, but we've had a hell of a lot more say no. Like, I don't get it, I don't understand it, come back next year when actually you have greater revenues and we do it, and come back and they don't do it, like, so you have mm -hmm. this vicious cycle. 
So in that, I can only deal with what I can control, and that's building a good business. Do you need a, a strategic e-commerce partner, someone investing? I don't think we need a strategic mm -hmm. e-commerce mm -hmm. partner. Um, or commerce partner. But look, at investor. the end of the day, like, I mean, Procter Gamble does 90 billion in revenue a year, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's scale. Mm -hmm. uh, for me to say that we're going to go from kind of our revenue to 90 billion without having the need to raise any more money ever, that would be naive and mm -hmm. silly, mm -hmm. right? In the meantime, we can do what we can to build a great business and hopefully find folks right. that want to join us along the ride, but we'll see what, what happens. What do you think of these sales of these others, like Dollar Shave Club, for example? Yeah. I just had a lunch with Michael. Yeah. Uh, look, he I mean, looked unhappy, though. Oh, well, <laughs> Here is the minute. It the might have been Trump. But the <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, was. Touche. Uh, the minute that came out, the first thing I did, like, I mean, I, I don't have a close relationship with Michael, mm -hmm. but I sent him an email and I was like, congratulations, man, you did it. You mm -hmm. did it. Mm -hmm. Like, you did it. Good right. for you, man. Like, I'm, I'm so excited for him. So here's what I think, you know, if we just focus on shaving specifically, mm -hmm. right? Um, and look, our, our opportunity is way bigger than shaving. Here's why I'm excited. Um, so now, in our aisle, uh, that shaving aisle, you're going to have these multi-blade competitors. You're going to have the Gillettes of the world, you're going to have the Schicks of the world, right. you're going to have the Dollar Shaves of the world, you're going to have the Harry's of the world, you're going to have the private label brands of the world, all of whom are selling kind of like these multi-blade races, right? Really with no differentiation around R&D, et cetera. No. Inevitably what happens there is a race to the bottom. And this is something that we had always kind of uh, thought about years ago. In fact, a couple months ago, Gillette said, hey, we're going to cut across the board 20% of all of our products. It's already starting. Meanwhile, like you look at us. Look, I mean, I'll just give you a few stats in our channel. Our average order values are $65. If you include our trimmer, they're north of 100. Mm. Our next closest competitor is 12. A lot of folks think about us as the black shaving brand. In fact, most of the folks that buy our stuff offline, 60% are white men, right? Um, we're 40% millennial. Target is only 20%. We're sending new customers to their store, up-leveling the category, introducing people to a new way to shave. We're fine, right? right? We're not what, subject to all that downward pressure. Are offline are white men. 60% uh, of customers that shop in Target to buy our product Why? are white men. Because they just think it's a better experience. It is. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but also, um, look. I was like thinking, what's going on? Get well, out? No. Good <laughs> <Good movie. laughs> oh, movie. Go man. see that movie. <laughs> Good plug. You're so cool. Um, so, but, but here's, I mean, this is symbolism for 15 years, uh -huh. I always had to go to aisle 15, the ethnic beauty aisle, which is always next to the beauty aisle, mm -hmm. and our stuff is in a beauty aisle now. Uh -huh. right. So when folks look at our packaging, it's beautiful, stark white packaging, very minimalist, like thoughtful, and they pick it up, and they look in the back, and they understand, like, all right, wow, this fixes this issue that I've had, and nobody's fixed it. So they're not thinking in look, terms of race. Well, but here's the, the funny thing. If you look at the back of a product, we have kind of photos as one of me and like other customers and stuff. Um, and it's like black man, Latino man, like black man, Latino man, yeah. like that sort of thing. And one of the best lessons I've learned on this um, was from an old retired Procter & Gamble executive. She has this philosophy in retail. She likes to call it 1031. And you want to attract people 10 feet away. So you're in the aisle, like oh, what's the beautiful, nice. so you think about like the Thai packaging. It's like this stark red thing. And then you want to kind of hook them three feet away, right? Mm -hmm. Like what about this thing actually is interesting. So you look at our packaging, it says it helps eliminate razor bumps, irritation, et cetera. And then you want to really close them on the one foot sale, right? That's mm -hmm. when they turn it on the back. By then, we've got them, right? Mm -hmm. This beautiful packaging with messaging that's clearly differentiated. And then now, by the time they see that there's a black man on the packaging, it's not about race anymore. Right. Right. You combine that with the ethnic beauty aisle, you're walking down that aisle, you're just thinking race, right. race, right. race, right. race, right. products yep. that work, race, race. That is a good uh, we've point. completely fixed that paradigm. So you've calmed them down by we that have. time. Okay. We have. All we right. Have. So, <laughs> one very quick question, then we're going to get to questions from the audience. How, well, how do you look at the whole retail scheme? I guess Amazon would be the. How do you look at it right uh, now? What's going I think, on? Um, God, without kind of putting my foot in my mouth, go I right think ahead. Amazon is on a tear. Um, one thing that people don't understand about Amazon and don't give them enough credit for is that they make <laughs> good products themselves that are private label. Yeah, they are. Um, the one stat that has stuck out with me for a while that a lot of folks in Silicon Valley don't understand, and a couple of years ago, private labels. 25% of all retail. Mm -hmm. 10 years after that, it's going to be 50%, right? Um, and for me, in the health and beauty space, um, the, really the last vertical that a lot of these retailers haven't tackled yet is health and beauty, and that's where all the margin is. Right. Um, so for me, it's like, all right, how do we build something uniquely compelling, uniquely differentiated, high margin, uh, where we can get that lock-in? 
Um, look, I mean, Amazon is a wonderful partner of ours. Right. Target, Are you nervous? Do they make you nervous? I'm always nervous. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, until we get to $90 billion in revenue, it's no holds barred, man. Like, this right. isn't a friendly game, right? Like, I mean, I love our but, partners but from a retail perspective. But you don't mind being on there, but are you worried about them moving in? I'm always worried about that. I mean, look, innovation is innovation. It's there for a reason. People can build whatever they want, right? right. I, I try to be as paranoid as possible. Are you um, mostly paranoid about them or anybody else? No, not really. Look, I mean, we built Bevel in six months. We built our electric trimmer in a year. We built this new brand that's launching that's 10 SKUs in a year. And we're getting better and better and better. And we've only done it with 25 people. The typical kind of uh, launch cycle for a lot of these CPG companies is 24 to 36 months, right? We're getting it inside of six months. So even if we launch something new that isn't as successful as we'd hope, we'll launch another one. If we kind of launch something that's getting a little bit of traction, we can launch another version of it, and another version of it, and another version of it before the incumbent actually launches something that's brand new. Um, so I'm not too worried about that, as long as we have the team um, to actually kind of create this innovation. I mean, we've been fine thus far, and nobody's really come in our lane in a way that's truly intimidating. Right, so you're really not Silicon Valley, are you? I, uh, look, I mean, that kind of goes both ways, at least in the way that we run our business. We try and run our business like a business. Whether or not you call that Silicon Valley, New York, or anything like that, I'm yeah. a bit agnostic to it. I can't believe you live in Palo Alto. I can't either. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. Um, questions from the audience? Questions? J remember what Jason's going to do, so stand up. Oh, hi. Hi. How are you? Do I need to stand up? All right. Hello, my name is Sean Harris. Hi, Sean. <laughs> That's a get out joke. Go see the movie. Wow. Yeah, exactly. It's not a good place. <laughs> it's not a good place. Um, so what are, you, what are your plans? Kind of Lucy mentioned, you know, looking at international growth and in, in those markets because of you know, how large they are. Mm -hmm. Certainly there would be probably different economics with respects to, you know, the price points of the, your bevel blade or razors today and where it would need to go. Of course. Kind of, what's your plan there and when are you looking to go beyond North America? No, that's a great question. Well, look, first and foremost, we haven't done really anything in America yet, right? So even, even if, even if uh, one was to kind of think about us as like shaving for black like people, there are 40 million of us. We don't have 40 million consumers, <laughs> right? Just domestically, right? Uh, you skip continents and like go to Africa, right? Like, you know, now you Where open would up be the billions and billions see? and billions of people. Uh, well, so one thing, it's a good question, I forgot to mention, thanks for asking it. We have customers in 14 different countries, and we only sell domestically. Like, we have customers who will buy our product domestically, use a forwarding address, pay $50 every three months to actually get our product for shipping. Like, it's absurd. So we're just going to follow where our customers are. Um, so we have good numbers in um, Europe, particularly like the UK. Uh, we have some in Brazil. Brazil is a really interesting market. It's probably the fastest growing market in all of health and beauty. Um, so, I mean, those two alone, mm -hmm. let's not even you know, talk about kind of the larger Asia, <laughs> right? Um, so, like, our COO that we've hired is fantastic. She's a wonderful woman, Joanne. Uh, she came from Estee Lauder, uh, where she ran the international business for the Le Maire business for Estee Lauder, so premium luxury business. Before that, she ran all international strategy for MAC Cosmetics, so she has this beautiful blend of multicultural, premium, international experience. Um, and we chose her for a reason. Right? Um, not only she's wonderful at what she does, um, but you know, we chose her because we saw that as a future for us. And we're going to take it very seriously. Great. We have time for one more quick question. Sorry, I messed up the time, but go ahead, right here. Right here, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, is there someone right there? Sorry. All right, right there. Go ahead. Let's keep these short so we can. Wait, is there someone have it? Oh, who's got it? Right here. Okay. So my name is Tara. My name is Tara. I have a uh, podcast called She Built That. And I wanted to know, um, you're talking about expanding into health and beauty space. I wanted to know, is there a company that is doing it that you kind of look up to that you think is done, doing it well? And in I, health and beauty specifically? Yeah, because yeah, you talked about you're, you're expanding to women and then eventually want to go bigger. Yeah, so the company I respect most in this entire space is Estee Lauder. 100%. 100%. Why is that? Um, Estee Lauder has a unique view on who they are. Right? You ask any Estee Lauder kind of employee what they do, they're like, we're prestige. You're in mass, I don't even want to talk to you. Right? We are prestige, we build prestige brands, and we do it better than everybody. Right? Um, you know, it's funny, I have these like, debates with Joanne, who came from Estee Lauder, um, and look, we always talk about like, this fundraising stuff, strategics and all that jazz, and it's like, hey, should we consider Estee Lauder? She's like, no, they won't take you because you're in, like, in mass. Right? And that has nothing to do with like, 
um, kind of our product or our brand. They just know who they are and they focus and they do it uniquely well. And they're really good at finding things super early, like really early. They bought all the, like La Mer was one of those brands that they bought 20 years ago for a pulse, like a million some dollars or something like that probably, right? Now it's a billion dollar brand, right? And they rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat. And I think all too often there are a lot of, certainly in the health and beauty space, folks chase the money. Uh, versus like chasing who they are first and then finding the money. That's a really good point. That makes sense. All right, one last one right here. Did you? No. Any more questions? Okay, last one right there. Hi, uh, my name is Hubert Kim. Uh, you're addressing a market uh, for colored people for shaving generally. When P and G or Unilever says, "Hey, that sounds like a great idea," what protects you guys from <laughs> from them developing a similar solution? Sure. It's my favorite question. <laughs> So I'll start with the story, um, and I'll tell you why, quite matter-of-factly. So this whole industry started uh, back in 1904, 05, around then. And there's this guy, his name is King Gillette, wonderful man. He said, for hundreds of years, barbers have been using this thing called the straight razor to great efficacy. Cuts the hair level with the skin, uh, not beneath like some multi-blade razors do. It's one clean cut, no pulling or tugging like most multi-blade razors do. But it's actually pretty hard for you to use yourself at home. Right? If you're not trained, you might cut yourself, et cetera. So you had this brilliant insight. He said, what if you can take a single blade, house it within a safe head, attach a handle to it, take it home with you and shave? And that started the mass market shaving industry as we know it, similar to the tools that we have now. Now fast forward 20, 25 years later, you lose the patent for it. And many would argue, right? This doesn't come from me, so many would argue that the only reason we have two, three, four, five, six, 38 blade razors today is purely due to patent protection. But if you actually travel internationally, single blade is a hell of a lot more popular than multi because they can maintain their margin. Now, the reason I kind of um, give that story, let's think, if you are a kind of CPG brand manager focused on shaving, the first mistake you're gonna make, similar to what you just asked, right? Like, those guys are shaving for people of color, which is wrong, right? Like, we're shaving, right? Um, so they're gonna look at specifically black men shaving in the US. So they'll go read some Mintel research report, right, some Nielsen report. Black men shaving in the US, $300 million. Now, Procter & Gamble's a $90 billion revenue company. If they wanna chase a new opportunity, a new brand, they have to yield a billion dollars in revenue in the first year, right? So $300 million, it's like even if we have 100% market share, we're not gonna do it. The thing that's so fascinating about that is they never ask why the, the market's so small. Perhaps the market's so small because the things you sell them they can't use, right? And, the, and if you really, really think about this, like really think about this, it's $14 billion in revenue, let's just say Gillette, right? Um, and pa significant patent protection. I think that the only way any of these guys are gonna win is to engage in some semblance of creative destruction where they say, all right guys, we apologize for telling you that the past 100 years and more is better. We're gonna go back to single blade and teach you like really the right way to shave. And the reason I say that, I mean, you'd laugh, but in 2040, when we have a majority-minority flip, most curly-haired people, what are they gonna be using? Right, like this is a seismic, seismic shift that like a lot of folks don't understand, and if they don't understand it, that's fine, we'll make that money. All Make right, sense? on that note.